my name is Robert Cameron. I'm a <coughs> thoracic surgeon at UCLA and the West Los Angeles VA Medical Center. And uh, I've had a, a long interest in mesothelioma from a research standpoint. So uh, I'm going to give the initial talk just as everybody's settling in uh, so that when the real speakers come up, uh, they'll be able to be, everybody to be ready for it. But um, we've had a, a long history of taking care of mesothelioma patients at UCLA. And uh, I want to talk about some of the concepts which are not always um, talked about a lot in terms of uh, taking care of these specific patients. So uh, my title of my talk is going to be talking about mesothelioma as a sarcoma. Uh, and some of this kind of dates back to when I went to SWOG meetings in the past. Uh, mesothelioma in SWOG was always included with uh, the sarcoma group rather than the lung group, and it always kind of frustrated me. But then after <coughs> thinking about it for a while, it actually makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to talk about how mesotheliomas and sarcomas uh, are similar tumors, or actually very similar tumors. Just to give you a couple of caveats in my background, I trained in general surgery at UCLA, and, and it, it, at the time it was a very big... Uh, surgical oncology center, so I was going to be a surgical oncologist initially, and uh, the surgical oncology service there treated uh, a whole bunch of sarcoma patients, and we actually, as interns, gave our own chemotherapy and did a lot of the, the primary treatment uh, and, and were involved in the treatment protocols in a, in a very realistic way, and so a lot of the background I, in terms of my general surgery training was in sarcomas. And I also uh, did a three-year fellowship at, at, at NCI, and, and it also in there uh, involved treating a lot of sarcoma patients in a similar way and also giving chemotherapy. So uh, in my training in thoracic surgery at uh, Memorial in New York as well, there were the general surgical, uh, the, uh, general surgical oncologist there also had a lot of uh, sarcoma patients, and we treated them when they had lung metastasis. So... A lot of this comes from just the background of treating a lot of sarcomas and seeing how they're similar. I have no conflicts, but I have one disclosure, and that's um, that is, uh, I guess, I'm a mesotheliomophile. So, the, the, the question is, what is a what is a mesotheliomophile? So, the file, uh, the definition of file from the Cambridge Online Dictionary says that someone who isn't interested in a particular thing, a follower, enthusiast, addict, junkie. But I didn't really like the maniac or nut. But some people probably think that I am. Um, so I'm going to not talk about mesothelioma for a second. I'm going to talk about what is a sarcoma. So sarcomas are cancers of connective tissue. So they're what's called mesenchymal tissue in uh, medical language. And so those are involved with soft tissues, uh, sarcomas, nerve tissue, muscle. There's a bunch of fancy names like lyomyosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, fibrosarcoma, angiosarcoma. So they're all these different tumors that are involved with soft tissues. One of the ones I wanted to just point out a little bit is the epithelioid sarcoma, and I'm going to come back to that later because uh, it's, it's, I think, fairly relevant to mesothelioma. There's also bony sarcomas of the bones and joints, uh, cartilage, and, and uh, their whole group. So uh, <coughs> in relationship, what is the mesothelioma and mesothelioma? That's the, that's the million dollar question is how, how are these things potentially related? So I'm going to talk a little bit about a basic kind of concept. This is a piece of tissue. It's actually a piece of the esophagus. So when you look at normal human tissue, there's usually uh, an epithelial layer in organs, uh, in almost every organ, lung, uh, stomach, colon, everything that has a, a, a layer like this that has dark uh, areas with a lot of cytoplasm, so it's dark pink with dark cytoplasm and many nuclei. And then there's a mesenchymal layer, which is this layer, and it's, it has many fewer nuclei, it has flatter cells, and it's more whitish in, in appearance. So this epithelial layer is, is the division between the outside world, which is in here, uh, and, the, and the patient, so in the inside person. So there's always that epithelial, what's called epithelial layer. Uh, and in the different cells, in the epithelial layer, there's usually large cuboidal cells, and in the, in the mesenchymal layer, there's thinner, smaller, kind of cigar-shaped cells. So if you go back to embryology and see how this all comes about, there's usually three layers that uh, your body develops from. So this is in the embryo, this is the inside of the body, this is the outside, 
And so there's an ectoderm, which as it sounds like ecto means outside, uh, endoderm, which endo means inside, so that's in here, and this develops where all the organs are, and this develops where the skin is, and the nerves, and in the middle there's the mesoderm, and the mesoderm is just the tissue in the middle, and as you can see here, it, it actually divides on the out, outer side of this and forms a what's called a parietal and visceral pleura, a, a, a layer, uh, which ends up uh, surrounding this cavity, which is called the salamic cavity, and that eventually divides into the pleural peritoneum and pericardium, which are the places that mesothelioma comes from. So <clears throat> when you look at what is mesothelioma, me meso and mesothelioma, or mesothelium, is middle, and the thelium is layer of cellular tissue, so it's the middle layer. Um, and if you want to look at embryologically where mesothelioma comes from, you look at the different layers. So the ectoderm, you get different tumors from there. So you get brain, skin, melanoma, and breast cancers come from the ectoderm. Uh, and then the endoderm, you get a lot of the other usual ones. You get lung cancer, uh, gastric cancer, stomach, pancreas, colon, rectum, um, and GU, including the bladder, kidney, and all the organs involved with uh, urinary tract. So all these Usual, usual uh, cancers people hear about come from the endoderm and then some like breasts from the ectoderm. The mesoderm uh, only really generates sarcomas and mesothelioma. So when you look at embryologically, these two tumors are come from the same layer and appear very similar. Now this is a normal pleura, so this you can see is a little bit like the previous um, esophageal layer here a little bit. There's a, there's, there is a layer here between this area and this area. This is the, um, the zancomal area again, and this is the quote-unquote outer area. And the same cuboidal cells are along here, but there's also some flat cells in the pleura. Uh, and then underneath here is, is the usual mesenchymal cells. But the problem is that uh, the mesothelium is, is not... Um, like the, like the epithelium is that there's not an outside world. It's actually, this is what it actually looks like. Here's the lung. You can see little, low, little white areas, which are the air pockets in the lung, the alveoli. And then you come to the pleural surface, and then there's a visceral and a parietal pleural surface that are opposed to each other. So you really don't have an outer layer that this is going to. It just has uh, one going to the other. So this is the parietal pleural edge, and this is the visceral pleural edge. And when you look at that, the epithelial layer uh, between the mesenchymal is, is in the layer between the mesenchym, mesenchym and the outer world. Um, however, the mesothelial layer is, between, is a layer between mes, uh, mesenchym and more mesenchym. So it's not really the same. So the mesothelium is not really the epithelium. So the, the, when you use the word epithelial or epithelioid more appropriately with mesothelioma, it's not, it's not like an epithelial tumor. So when you look at using this, looking at characteristics, these are true epithelial tumors like lung cancer and, and breast cancer and other cancers, and these are sarcomas. Uh, and when you look at the, the characteristics of these, they're, they're completely uh, different, where local growth, for instance, epithelial tumors tend to grow into things very aggressively and attach to things in, in a very irregular way. Sarcomas grow with pushing edges, that is, they tend to grow and get crowded, more crowded than they have. Uh, what's called a pseudocapsule, whereas uh, epithelial tumors don't have a pseudocapsule. The pseudocapsule is really just the tumor cells creating a kind of a fibrous area around it where it appears that the tumor has an edge to it, a clear edge to it, although that's not entirely true. Um, some epithelial tumors do spread the lymph nodes quite aggressively, and they also spread distantly. Uh, they don't have what's called tumor seeding. If you put a needle into them, biopsy them, most of the time they don't seed through where the needle went, uh, but sarcomas do. So that's, that's a different kind of characteristic. Um, and these other th characteristics like lymph node spread and, and distance spread is a little bit variable. So in, in sarcomas, uh, there are, for the most part, almost no lymph node metastases in most sarcomas. However, there's a couple of them which are um, synovial cell and the, the epithelioid that I spoke about earlier that do have a, a lot of um, lymph node metastasis of between 30 and 45 percent. So there are a subset of sarcomas that do have that kind of activity and, and there's a, you know, a variable amount of distance spread depending on the, the grade of the tumors. So now if you compare mesothelioma with sarcomas, 
you can see that basically a lot of the characteristics are the same, and, the, and it actually should be because the embryology should predict that it would be the same. So the growth is again kind of pushing. Um, there is a pseudo capsule around it, and lymph node spread is variable and depending on the subtype, and I'll talk about that just in a second. Tumor seeding is uh, often, that's a big problem. Uh, so it's very similar, and the and distance spread is variable. So um, if you look at ep mesothelioma, I've always talked about this, there's, there's basically two diseases. There's an epithelioid mesothelioma and a sarcomatoid, and they act pretty much uh, completely different, uh, and we, have, we treat them differently. So um, there is a third kind of type that people talk about, which is called biphasic, but that's just a mixture of the other two. So there's really only two main types. And what we do at UCLA is we, we determine the predominant cell type. We don't treat three types, we treat one or two. And so we figure out most of the, the tumors are either 80 per, 70 or 80 percent one or the other. There's very few of them that are actually in the middle where there's 50-50. So if you look at the histology uh, from mesothelioma slides, these, these are what tumor cells look like. And these are more like the epithelial cells where they're large cuboidal cells with lots of cytoplasm. Uh, and very few little narrow cells in this. So that, that's what it looks like um, for a mesothelioma. And if you look at an epithelioid uh, sarcoma, it looks very similar. These are very similar cells, large cells, a lot of cytoplasm with very few small cigar-shaped cells. So for an epithelioid uh, tumor, either a sarcoma or a mesothelioma, it looks very similar. This is the standard kind of sarcoma. This is a sarcomatoid mesothelioma where you see small, thin cells that are lined up in, in whorls and that kind of area. And this is a sarco regular sarcoma, fibrosarcoma, and it looks like very similar appearance. So um, from the standpoint of, of all the different factors that you can look at, the different uh, sarcomas and mesothelioma, you can find a lot of similarities. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at now mesothelioma versus sarcoma, but look at the variable areas that we talked about, lymph node metastases and distant metastases. You can look at the subtypes of each. You can see that they actually line up. So epithelioid mesothelioma and epithelioid sarcoma actually have, have very common lymph node metastasis and less common distant spread because they tend to be more localized diseases for a longer period of time. And if you look at the other ones, the sarcomatoid mesothelioma uh, and the regular sarcomas, you see that the lymph node spread is actually very uncommon. Uh, and it's, it's very common to have distant metastases. So these are uh, characteristics of the subtypes. So if you look at epithelioid mesothelioma, it equals pretty much the characteristics in the act of epithelioid sarcoma. Sarcomatoid meso is, a, is really equivalent to sarcomas. And so really, you look at mesothelioma overall, it is, it's basically a sarcoma. So one of the things I want to talk about is how this affects our uh, surgical management and management overall. If you look at the, the issue of having a, sar a sarcoma pseudocapsule, uh, not many people will talk about mesothelioma pseudocapsule, but it, it actually um, allows uh, us to do surgery. And when you look at sarcoma pseudocapsules, it allows you to actually take this out. And in surgical oncology, uh, that's a, a, actually a big problem because uh, oftentimes surgeons who are general surgeons find a sarcoma and they take it out and they take it out through the pseudocapsule, which is an incomplete resection. It's a, what we call an R1 resection. Um, and uh, in terms of sarcomas, that's not adequate, but in mesothelioma, it does allow us to actually even operate on these patients because if you've ever uh, if anybody's ever actually tried to do the same operation that we do for mesothelioma with other tumors, it is actually physically impossible. So uh, what we also do, because of sarcomas, um, there's, a, there's a kind of a principle that you don't take out vital organs if you're not completely resecting a tumor, and that's true with retroperitoneal sarcomas and other sarcomas, where if you're, if you're really not getting the whole thing out, you wouldn't sacrifice other normal organs, uh, vital organs. So in order to preserve vital organs, we, we try to preserve the lung in, in this case, which is similar to pre preserving kidneys and other things for retroperitoneal sarcomas. When you deal with wound seeding, <clears throat> this is an, obviously an issue um, with biopsies. So you get to plan biopsies and take out uh, areas that have been seeded. But there's a couple of issues with that that I think uh, that we approach a little bit uniquely. And one is 
uh, if you're going to have wound seeding, then you have to be aware that your surgical procedure, whenever you do it, is going to seed tumor tissue everywhere you go. So it's better, for, we feel, I feel, to keep existing tissue planes intact. So I keep the pericardium and diaphragm intact and do not take them out because if when you open it up, then you tend to spread the tumor into those areas. And in fact, when you really look at the reported for EPPs and aggressive uh, pleurectomies that take out the diaphragm, there's a in, in very high recurrence rate in the peritoneum. It's 50% or greater. And that's from us opening up the peritoneum and, and spreading the tumor cells into that area um, <clears throat> during the surgery. So if you don't do that, you tend to keep things more controlled than where they, where they were originally. So I also minimize surgical procedures. So some people go back and excise all the ports where the biopsies were done, but we don't do that unless there's gross tumor there because we know we're not taking out all the tumor, and uh, we know that if we do a bigger operation and take a, make a bigger incision and take out more tissue to take out just an incidental incision or a scar, then we're just actually spreading the tumor potentially even to a bigger area. So this is just a, a picture from an operation. This is a chest open. This is a normal chest uh, where the ribs and the muscles are, and in here, it's hard to see. Is there any way to dim the lights a little bit? Because I think we're going to have to need that for later. Um, it's hard to see, but the, this is a smooth surface. So <clears throat> the, the reason we can do these surgeries is because we can actually physically pull this tumor off the back of the ribs and the, and the muscle of the chest wall. Um, and that's a unique thing because <clears throat> if, you, if you can't do that, then you can't do the operation anywhere in the chest because it's stuck. So this is actually the pseudocapsule of the, of the mesothelioma. And then here you can see a little incision, and then underneath this is the lung. And the same thing applies to the lung. So you can actually peel the tumor off the lung very, very easily and just as completely as on the back of the, of the uh, ribs because of the same thing. There's a pseudocapsule there. So the pseudocapsule, the PC, makes surgery even possible. And it, but it does make it incomplete, so you have to take that into account when you're planning the future therapy. Um, and this is what looks like at the end of the, of the diaphragm. This is a, a picture of the inside the chest. Here's, a, again, the incision. This is looking down towards the feet. So this is the diaphragm, and up here is the pericardium. So you can see that the, this is, if you know it, you're, if you recognize this is normal muscle on, on the diaphragm. We just peel the tumor off the top. And then this is the pericardium, which is a smooth surface because we peeled the tumor off the surface of the pericardium. So this just shows that, you know, with a pseudocapsule, you can peel this all off, but there are tumor cells left here, and that's something you have to take into account. So uh, in, when we try to actually preserve the pericardium, we can do that in over 90% of the patients. We can also preserve the diaphragm, uh, at least partially, where there's, tum where there's diaphragm muscle still left uh, in over 90%. So implications for uh, surgical timing, uh, I just want to talk about the epithelioid versus sarcomatoid. Uh, we approach these differently because they're a different nature. So epithelioid tumors tend to be, uh, have a local, more of a local problem for a longer period of time. They tend to grow in the chest. They tend not to spread to other organs, whereas the sarcomatoid type tend to vigorously spread to other, other organs. So, and also, the epithelioid is less invasive. The sarcomatoid tends to be more locally invasive. Um, so when you look at the epithelioid kind, our strategy is to attack it locally, uh, since that is the primary problem. And so what, one of the treatment regimens is to do surgery first and the radiation. And these are both local treatments, and then do chemotherapy last, uh, if you do it at all. And if you do the sarcomatoid, what we, we looked at is actually doing a different kind of strategy, looking at systemic control first. So we started doing a strategy of doing chemotherapy first, followed by surgery and radiation. And this is similar to what people do for sarcomas, uh, even unresectable sarcomas, is you do chemotherapy first, and then, then you can often resect them and, and uh, do radiation either pre- or post-op. So what we, we did is we want to look back at our, we, we looked at our sarcomatoid patients at UCLA and we looked back over a 10 year period of time, we had 45 patients with what we identified as sarcomatoid predominant uh, tumors. Uh, and these patients really had the usual male to female ratio of, of uh, three to one, uh, right to left of 60, 40 roughly, and the mean age are just slightly younger, uh, 63 years versus what we usually have is 65, 66 years. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we looked at how these patients were treated. We, we actually had a, a pr prospective uh, 
protocol to try and treat these patients with preoperative therapy uh, later in this time period, and that was based on some of the results that we had from earlier on. So <clears throat> um, 29 of the patients that we, we had seen were actually treated non-operatively because they usually had metastatic disease. So uh, metastatic disease was a big problem uh, at presentation, and even some of them who went for preoperative treatment with, ke with chemotherapy uh, had problems with uh, metastatic disease that they discovered even before they can get chemotherapy in a very short period of time. Some of them were poor surgical candidates and some people just preferred not to have surgery in that setting. Um, we had two patients that we didn't really have follow-up, so we're going to talk about the remaining 14, 13 of which were operated on at UCLA. So when you look at the, the tumors clinically staged, uh, most of them were T2 uh, and 0. And uh, uh, pathologically ended up being most of them T3 and T4 tumors with uh, a fair amount of lymph node metastases at 30%. So this is the kind of thing you see with uh, less often with sarcomatoid mesos usually, but or with epithelioid uh, tumors. Uh, but there was a fair number of, of patients. And then, um, I want to talk about several different groups so you can kind of get some, in, some impression of how these people do. Two patients never received any additional therapy, and that's because they didn't do very well uh, after, after their induction therapy. Um, four patients actually um, received unknown chemotherapy because they went back to their oncologist, and we could never get any follow-up data from them, so we didn't know what they were treated with. And also four patients received postoperative chemotherapy. Uh, some of them received interferon, followed by cisplatin pemetrexid or cisplatin gemcitabine. Uh, and, and one re actually received a phosphamide doxorubicin. Uh, out of these eight patients, uh, four of them actually were patients that were uh, initially biopsied and, and thought to be epithelial tumors, but then uh, had sarcomatoid tumors at the end, so they were, they were not, that was not known preoperatively. There were four patients that were known to be sarcomatoid patients who actually had disease that was limited to the pleural space and known preoperatively, and so those patients we actually directed to do induction chemotherapy. Three of them got ifosamide, doxorubicin, the other one was supposed to get that, but then got shunted off, uh, unfortunately, to an experimental protocol with cisplatin, pemetrexid, and veglin. Um, this, is, this is something that you, it's hard to see, but uh, this is our results depending on the, the histology, histology subtype. So there's epithelial tumors have this survival, and here's the sarcomatoid mix. But overall, if you look at our historical controls, uh, the median survival for sarcomatoid predominant types, which come out of the biphasic and sarcomatoid group, is only 7.6 7, uh, 7 months. So it's a very short survival, uh, and uh, the, the uh, outlook is very dismal. So many, most people don't even, even consider operating on these patients. But when you look at the group, that actually had induction chemotherapy, um, and this was done from similar programs to from a sarcoma. And actually, part of it was, it was done because I had seen a sarcoma patient that looked very much like a mesothelioma patient, uh, and had gotten had gotten sarcoma treatment, and his tumor almost completely went away even from the pleura. So we tried to treat the meso patients in a similar fashion, and so we used sarcoma drugs, which are ifosamide, uh, doxorubicin. Uh, and for patients who are at higher risk, gemcitabine, taxotere. Um, and so we, we figured that this would reduce the micrometastatic disease if they haven't presented with metastatic disease, and it allows uh, selection of patients for surgery who respond to chemotherapy. So we did that, and it also allows the assessment of the tissue response uh, after surgery by looking at the pathology. So we looked at the outcomes from these four patients, um, there was, uh, if you looked at the pathology results after they got resected, they had uh, 80 to 99 percent necrosis, which is how sarcomas are graded, in three out of the four, and one had uh, a minor response. And if you looked at the survival of the patients that actually got chemotherapy, had a reasonable response, they, their median survival was 19.6 months, and two of them are still alive. So these patients seem to be doing better, uh, despite the fact that they had sarcomatoid tumors. So this gives us our current treatment protocol for sarcomatoid meso patients that they either get palliative care or chemotherapy alone if they're not really good operative candidates. But if they're operative candidates and they have disease limited to the 
pleural area without metastasis, then we give them preoperative chemotherapy with sarcoma protocols. We do surgery, and then we can do postoperative therapy based on that, uh, on the results from the surgery. So uh, to summarize, uh, mesothelioma, uh, in terms of our aspect, is, is really a sarcoma by embryology, histology, and tumor behavior. Um, the treatment strategies we think should take, be taken and, and be treated with uh, uh, induction chemotherapy and also surgery eventually, um, doing R1 resections through the pseudocapsule uh, and preserving the, the uh, tissue planes. Induction chemotherapy we think is, is critical as these patients obviously have very low survival with, with uh, anything else. Uh, and the chemotherapy should be sarcoma type drugs. Uh, because that's the kind of tumors that they really, really are. So I wanted just to thank, there's a whole, obviously when you have a program that treats these patients, you need a lot of help, and so we have lots of people that, that we collaborate with. Olga Olesky is fortunately uh, an oncologist that understands mesothelioma because there are a lot of people that we've had, we've had uh, discussions with who keep referring to mesothelioma as an epithelial tumor, so they want to treat with epithelial drugs, and it's hard to get them to understand that. John Barsis has been very supportive. Michael Selch has been our radiation uh, oncologist for a long time. He just recently retired, so Percy Lee is now um, taking over for that. Michael Fishbein has been a really good uh, pathologist. Ferdinand Apton is the one we'll talk about later. He's, he's the radiologist that does our cryoablations. He's very, very active. Nir Hoffman is our um, anesthesiologist who uh, has been really good about getting our patients out of surgery without many complications. And we have a bunch of nurse practitioners. Wendy Nelson has been taking care of the inpatients. And then we have all of our researchers. Uh, Raymond Wong is going to talk a little later. Irina Yan Kivescu and Dong Mai Hao, who's going to uh, present some, I'll, I'll present some data from uh, later. And Martha Martinez does all of our arrangements. So there's a huge group of people that, that you need for help. So um, that concludes my talk. Uh, and uh, I can, I guess I can, we're going to group the questions for later. So.